The 2023 Rolex Fastnet race was as brutal as it was spectacular, and it made for a fascinating story. I know that because over 200,000 of you watched the story we made about it in the first two days. Thanks for that. But what happened next? The first boat to finish was Francois Gabbard's SVR La Zatigue, who beat Armel Le Cliège, his Bank Populaire, by one hour. The victory and new record was especially sweet for Gabbard, who'd been pipped at the post two years ago by Gitana 17. I'm not saying I don't care about the record, but it was the uh, first race and uh, yeah, our goal was to try to win and uh, we did it, so uh, very, very happy. and. Uh, that's a long time uh, we didn't win, so it was a uh, good part. And that's uh, two years, his uh, birthday was yesterday, so it's a good present for his birthday, uh, for the boat. SVR completed the course in one day, eight hours and 38 minutes, to set a new course record for the new course. For the 32 meter foiling trimarans, the Rolex Fastnet race is a walk in the park. Designed for trans-ocean racing, 700 miles is all in a day's work for these foil-born monsters. But the Fastnet course has a number of twists and turns compared to a lap of the planet, which makes it much trickier than simply sending the beast in a straight line. Nipping at the old team heels with the Ocean 50 trimarans. Not only are these boats just half the length of an old team, they don't foil above the water either. So, for the three finishers to complete the course in two days and seven hours was staggering. And the racing was very close. Got to say, this is the oldest boat of the fleet, 2009, and I'm very happy to and proud to bring a victory. We knew the start was uh, su supposed to be difficult, but uh, luckily we, we, start, we started before the other boat, so it was a... Um, not easy for us, but uh, easier. Tough condition, up to 35, uh, maybe 40, 40 knots. But was uh, doing well, the crew as well. It was the first time I had these conditions on a multi-hull, at the helm of a multi-hull. And swell, I think that was about three meters. We were really jumping up and down and it was bouncing around a lot. Uh, as I told Pierre, uh, I rounded the fastnet uh, twice and uh, never seen it. And uh, this time it was really great because it was just uh, before the sunset. Yeah, that was really perfect. We, we nearly lost the race a couple of times today. <laughs> First uh, near Aldeny or the High Blanchard. We managed to overtake them again afterwards, about an hour and a half before the finish. We are really close to the other boats. Uh, less than two minutes at the end, after more than 48 hours sailing, it's like uh, nothing, but uh, unfortunately we are second. Just at the last uh, jibe, uh, we realized that they were closer to the shore and had less current, and uh, so I, we had to do a double jibe to get just in front of us, and when we saw that we were crossing 0 0.2 miles, we thought we were going to lose it again, but I don't know how many times this race. The first monohull to cross the line was Charlie Darlin's Massif, finishing in just two days, seven hours and 16 minutes. Uh, yeah, that was a very intense race uh, from the first second. Uh, going upwind in 30 plus knots in the Solent, uh, foiling was crazy, incredible. Lots of overtaking, getting out of the of the channel, and then like this, like big sea waves, uh, big winds. So the Silly again, uh, yeah, we reached like almost 30, 40 knots uh, several times. Uh, crazy speed, 
and yeah, that was that was that was great. It was just playing. The pressure had been on throughout as Johan Rishom on Paprek Arkea finished just four minutes behind. Crazy battle in the end uh, with uh, Johan and, uh, and Jan. Uh, yeah, they, we caught them, they took off again, caught again, managed to overtake. And, uh, and yeah, and just at the end we had like a two miles lead and we got some seaweed in a kill. So yeah, we lost like 1.4 miles uh, due to this seaweed and, uh, and yeah, so we're pretty, <laughs> pretty relieved when, uh, when we got rid of that and, uh, and managed to extend again uh, to, the, to the finish. It's just incredible and yeah, I'm really happy. And then just 23 minutes later, it was Sam Goodchild aboard for the planet. For me, this was particularly impressive given that this was Sam's first proper offshore race in his brand new Emoka. We came into the race kind of seeing where we are with the, with the new fleet of 30 boats and, um, and we didn't think we were going to finish there, that's for sure. So I'm um, so pretty happy with that and, um, and hopefully we can um, kind of carry on doing such good results. I'm not sure it'll be that easy every time, but um, it's good to know we're at least we're in the right place. Yeah. We've been training since April. We did a small race in May, but it's the first real test with all the boats and, and especially as the fast always lives up to its name, some pretty full on conditions. So it's it's good to, to do that and um and sail tidily and get a good result. How apprehensive were you before the start given the given the punchy forecast? Um I mean I was mostly concerned about the start process and the getting out the solent. I mean it's not really what these boats are designed for, especially double handed. We're not really made made for manoeuvring, so um Getting out the Solent with almost 500 boats on the start line in one piece was number one objective. Um, and then obviously smashing up wind at 35 knots isn't very nice at the best of times. So, so trying to keep the boat in one piece was um, was really the main main aim. And then when we got into the Irish Sea, we were in a good position. So we were able to, to keep working on that and, um, and keep third to the finish. I mean, when you went out through the Solent, like um, so many boats, you were absolutely flying out through, uh, out through Hurst Narrows. I guess you had the advantage of not having the tide... Um, pushing you, it wasn't wind against tide at that stage, so the sea state was fairly flat compared to what it turned out to later on. But what kind of speed were you doing upwind as you as you went out? Oh uh, yeah, I mean definitely we were we were fortunate to get out quickly while the weather was still flat and with the foils boats on flat water the foils just get up and go. So we were I mean we were at 15, 16 knots upwind at that stage which which is pretty good going considering you're not bearing away to try and um go looking for a shift. You're just trying to stay high to um to, to sail out the solar quickly. So yeah, it's pretty, I and mean, when the boats have got flat water, they're, you know, they're pretty impressive. Hello, uh, so we're here in Ireland, found the coast. Uh, fa the fast net's about 30 miles that way, 32 miles. We've got Shirelle just up here. Um, and we've got Massif and uh, uh, Pack just in front of us. So, uh, and it stopped raining, so we're happy. Uh, but no, it's been a, a nice, uh, Relatively relaxing passage of the Irish Sea going across the Irish Sea, so that's good. And uh, now we're just looking at the weather before we head back south, so all good. So, yeah. And downwind, you say you got a fair bit of breeze on the way back. What kind of speeds were you hitting then? Yeah, on the way back we had that reach from basically from the fast net rock at sunset to the to the cities at sunrise, um, which was in between 20 and 35 knots and we were regularly hitting over 30 and it hit 37 at one stage so uh, it's, uh, it was going some and you start worrying a little bit about what the boat can handle but um, so far she's she's proven to be fairly bulletproof. And it was very interesting seeing the Amoka fleet line up, certainly the front end of the Amoka fleet line up with boats like um, uh, Lucky, the old Rambler 88 which we sort of know a bit about and I mean that's a bit of a datum isn't it? I mean she holds so many offshore records and yet some of you made mincemeat of her really on the downwind leg just overtook her. Yeah I guess it shows what the progress in foils has been really. The, um, to begin with they're a little bit not sure they're okay they're great in some conditions but not all then I mean the, the newer foils and the new designs well they're getting around their head around the technology now and how to make the best of them and it's um well, it's, I mean, the, the two, three new boats have just been put in the water. They're going upwind at 17, 18 knots, which is starting to look at multi-hull speeds at mod, mod 70s and multi 50s. So it's, um, it's impressive stuff, that's for sure. Um, and then on the reaching, the foils just to just add a real boost. And that was really when we got managed to drop drop a Rambler and the, well, the old Rambler, now lucky to, to, to get out in front of them. But yeah, it's um, impressive to know with, um, what is it, 30 foot less waterline, waterline length or... Um, 
we still give them a run for their money. The Class 40 fleet was one of the most hotly contested in the Grand Prix classes. And here, victory went to a young team, led by Erwan de Dreolek on Everiel. His four-man crew was made up of mini Transat and Figaro sailors, who clearly know their stuff when it comes to heading offshore. So uh, it was my first fastnet race, but it's uh, not the first time I go to the fastnet. Uh, nine for me, and I think uh, we are young, but uh, we are a lot of fastnet. <laughs> Today it was like uh, Solitaire du Figaro, and uh, it's uh, our first fastnet race, but mm, we did some Solitaire du Figaro, so it's a game we... we we like um, in France and with the current uh, we know and uh, the first night and the first day was uh, hard but the uh, team is good and the boat uh, it's, it's good, uh, we have no problem, nothing, never, uh, so it was really perfect. In the IRC fleet, Max Klink's 52-footer Caro was the overall winner. Uh, we never expected it, but uh, it was also like a very tough race, very hard competition. A legendary group of people. Um, luckily, we've been able to, to sail together for a few years. Sometimes we have been close to it, but never never got there. And it feels really good that we finally got a win in 600 miler. And it's the 50th edition of the Fastnet, so that's super special for us. Caro has a fantastic team on board. Uh, the boat's very, very well prepared. And uh, yeah, we sailed a really, really strong race. Aggressive when we needed to be, we backed off in when it was very fresh and rough. But you know, I look back on and yeah, we didn't leave many, many miles out there. So uh, yeah, it was good, we were really pleased. Uh, it's great that there's, there's owners who want to come and travel the world to race you know, fast nets, Caribbean 600s, and the fast net race that has to be is one of the ocean classics. So to uh, to be able to win it, you know, with a such a good team is uh, is great. Super happy, super excited, super proud of the uh, the guys. So yeah, doesn't get much better than this. As always with this race, there were so many great stories through the fleet, from the pros to the amateurs and family teams. But for me, there was one story that really stood out, that of Jim Driver and his 21-year-old daughter, Ellie. They regularly raced double-handed and did the Fastnet two years ago. In the IRC double-handed class this time, of the 96 entries, 47 retired and three didn't start. So just finishing this race was a major achievement. Jim and Ellie finished 10th in the class and 33rd overall in the entire IRC fleet. Big respect. We featured her in our start piece and shortly after they crossed the finishing line in Cherbourg, I caught up with Ellie. Well, Ellie, great to see you. What a fantastic race. I mean, you've literally just stepped off the boat, haven't you? Yep, pretty much about six hours ago we finished. So. Went, went to the beer tent to go, grab a well-deserved beer and, uh, yeah, pretty much still on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> so how was it? Yeah, good. You know, we were, everyone was expecting the first 40 knots of the race, um, but that's not really, not really how it kind of went on. It was 40 knots and then we had another 30 knots at Land's End and then another 30 knots to finish off the final race and in the last, like, 12 hours or so. Um to, just to top it off in the end. <laughs> How did you cope going through the first phase of it? Because I, we saw a lot of boats retire, over 80 boats retired in, I think, just inside the first 24 hours, possibly inside the first 12 hours. But you carried on. Was that the toughest bit? Yeah, I think for us, definitely double-handed. It was a get yourself through the first 16 hours of the race. That was always from the first grip is going to be the most difficult part and if you could get through that 12 hours or 16 hours then you would have a fighting chance to actually still be in the race and actually race to the end um so we went through it quite conservatively the start was crazy as you can imagine with the 100 so boats on rc2 um so we kind of stayed away a little bit and probably a bit too much and had a bit of a bit of a bad start um but off, off the start you know, all together nonetheless, um, and then took 
the track at the Hearst Channel instead of going through the needles to try and save ourselves going through the, the big standing waves at the needles, um, which I think saved us a bit because just of energy and, and everything else that comes along with trying to deal with these kind of weather situations um, means that we could prioritize the later parts in the race and keep our energy up for, for later on, which I think worked quite well. Yeah, well, it seemed to. And interesting, looking at some of the video you sent back early on, you were sailing with just a main, no jib. What was the thinking behind that? Yeah, so it, it, was, uh, it was getting us about 25 knots, and we had the two reefs in the main and a J3 at the start. So our J3 reefs to a J4. Um, but it, when you reef it, you've then got the reef at the bottom, and it, it's not great. Um, so and the wind then got up to about 30 33 knots and this was even before the 40 knots um so we're thinking do we just ditch the ditch the jib all together and put up a storm jib um ditch the jib and actually the boat was going pretty nicely a couple of degrees off what you would normally sail up wind but it was getting through the waves quite smoothly you weren't getting completely battered about still having to hold on pretty tight but um the boat was was doing its job and and looking after itself and kind of didn't didn't really see the point of trying to put up the storm jibs just left it as that um and it, it worked quite well for the start of it and got us through through the worst of it i think i saw something that you wrote early on saying that actually the other some of the other thinking was that if you had a head set up there was a danger that you were going to be flogging the main quite a lot and you were worried about that that really interested me that was an interesting approach yes that was the original reason why we we were going to change away from the J3. So when we have the J3 up and it's like 28 knots, the boat's boat's fine, but half of your main is flogging. And what happens when your main is flogging is that it's just putting extra pressure into the main. And every time the main flogs, it can increase the chance of the main getting damaged, like having a rip in it. Um, and if you rip your main, especially it's in the top half of the main, so you can't even reef that rip away. And if it's too big that you can't repair it, then it's pretty much a race over. Um, so we always try and stop the main from flogging. And in the 33 knots, by taking the jib down, it meant that we could have the main completely pulling the entire time and there wasn't a flog and, and it was going along pretty nicely without having any danger in any of the sails. So you get through that part of, uh, of the race and things calm down on the other side, but then looking on the tracker and looking at the weather it picked up a bit later on as well yeah it was it was quite nice after it, it calmed down we had about 10 15 knots and the fleet was kind of coming back together and then round land's end there wasn't much wind but there was supposed to be 22 knots coming in on the grip um which everyone's like okay 22 knots you know we've just been through 40 we, we can deal with 22 pretty easily uh, started off at 22 and then kept increasing, got up to about 33, 35 in the end. Um, so we actually went back down to just the main and, and took off the jib again. Um, but in taking the jib down on both times, we did manage to rich, rip the leech tape off the jib, which I then had to fix later in the race. So, you know, you, you, you fix one thing and, and maybe create an issue somewhere else. <laughs> and when you got round the rock, how was that? It was nice because, so Dad's done the race nine times. I've obviously only done it this is the second time. And every time he had done it before and last year, there was, it was pitch black. So neither of us had seen the rock. So this time we actually got to see the rock, actually have the camera boats out there and, and everything else. Um, so that was good fun to, to actually see what this uh, magnificent rock that everyone talks about actually looks like. <laughs> and the trip back from there, how was that? Yeah, it was, we were doing quite well with um there were two boats uh red ruby and bellino uh that we were chasing down as part of like the, the uk double-handed scene um and doing quite nicely with the code zero up and the genoa stay cell and we could we could see them on the as and we were getting closer pretty quickly like every 20 minutes we'd take about point two of a mile out of them um until i think we were pushing it a bit too far and managed to split the mow in half um, so then had to go to the jib and, and lost out a bit there, which was quite a bit of pain. And it would have been the mow would have been useful later in the race as well, but 
surprised by it. There wasn't one sail I could fix on the on the water, unfortunately, a bit bit past uh, the onboard sail loft. Um, and then went round the the Scilly Isles, pretty all right, and get got the kite up. And it's basically we didn't didn't jibe at all from putting the kite up in the Scilly Isles all the way to the finish. Hi everyone. Uh, we're all good on board Silly Pepper. Uh, we've just gone past the Silly Isles and a nice trip back from the rock and on to the rest of the race. No, so took the kite down about seven o'clock in the evening because there was supposed to be, as per, another 30 knots coming in. Um, and we wanted to kind of be ahead of this one with it going into dark and just wanting to be on the safe side, there's no, no point risking it at this point. Um, took the kite down and actually stayed below 25 knots for another hour um, than it was supposed to. So we kind of sat around on the jib being like, oh, should have kept the kite up. But actually the, the move actually saved just a couple of miles in the end because the boats that kept the kite up then, then overlaid and, and we gained it back. So that, that was all right. Um, and then the wind got up and we were... We were surfing down the waves on the jib, um, and the, the boat is amazing down the waves. And you, you can't stop the boat from wanting to surf, so, so it's basically the, the boat's way highway and, and quick mode or nothing kind of thing. <laughs> and, and what about sleep then? Because you told me before you went that actually your watch system was generally 45 minutes, sometimes, if you, sometimes you might extend that to an hour and a half. How did that play out over the, how many days was it? Five days you're out there? Yeah, so we, we didn't sleep for the first, like, in the first 30, 40 knots. Um, we did a couple of 30-minute naps. But, so we have, our sleep depends on, like, a few different things. And we have, like, different types of sleep. So it depends on the wind. It depends on um, kind of the stability of the boat in terms of the wind. So is the boat on the edge of, being a little bit sketch and you may need two people on deck or is the boat fairly stable? Is there um, something coming up? So say a sail change in half an hour that you're probably gonna have to do because you're going around and marking the course. And then we've got two types of sleeping where it's basically when you keep all of your oilies on and basically everything on so you can get on deck pretty quickly. Because obviously with the two of you, if something's going wrong, if one of you is asleep, you're going to need two hands pretty quickly um and if you're completely like taken off your oilies so then you can get a good night's sleep then you're going to be you're going to have a better sleep but you're not going to be as ready for for if something happens so after the initial 30 40 knots we got a couple of oilies on 30 minute kip kips each um, and then once the wind had settled it, settled a bit, we got into about an hour, hour and a half. And then actually from the, we made sure that by the time we got to the rock, we were both pretty well up on sleep. So by the time we went around the rock, we were both quite feeling all right. And then with the long code zero leg from the end of the fast neck TSS all the way down to the Silly Isles, it was quite stable. So we each had a couple of two hour sleeps then which is really useful in catching up sleep. Um, but it's just me when you wake up, you feel you wake up out of a, a deep sleep, but you do actually get a proper sleep and able to take all of your kit off and actually get into the sleeping bag and, and have a, a good quality one. What was the best bit about it? The race that is, not the uh, sleep. <laughs> the boat is amazing downwind. I, I love steering the boat downwind. It, it's something that the boat was built for. The 33 is not really built for upwind, um, but boy, it's, it's made for downwind. So that, that's pretty good. And overtaking class one boats just at the end, even just with the jib up, um, is always quite a lot of fun. So that that was good fun, obviously sailing with dad and just being in the, the iconic 50th fast now. Um, it just, and finishing the race is always quite, quite an achievement and making it round when you know unfortunately a lot of people didn't this year and and don't most years because it is notoriously a, a pretty pretty horrendous and and difficult race 
And how much did you draw on, or how useful was having done it before? Uh, I mean, probably a bit more extreme than last time, wasn't it? It was still a punchy start last time, but it sort of eased off after that. How did they compare? Yeah, last time, obviously the start was actually fairly similar. Um, but last time, it, the rest of the race was actually, it was below 20 knots, fairly easy. It was a bit of a longer race. I think it was about five hours longer or something last time that it took us than this one. Um, but the race was a lot more gentle. I think this time from the experience that I gained in the two years from doing the seven star around Britain and Ireland and all the other rock races for a couple of years, I think just my experience has grown so greatly that I've been able to actually race the race rather than just kind of get around it because it's it's one of the races where if you get around it it's a big achievement so a lot of people don't actually race it um so this time it was quite it it was special to actually be able to plan the four days and not just plan the next hour just to make sure you got through the entire race um and to be fair the result in the end we're, we're pretty happy with um so yeah i, th I think for as we're being quite conservative just to keep the boat in one piece and both of us in one piece um we're really happy that that we've got to the dock in in the place we have and and the boat boat semi all right and and we're pretty all right and what was the toughest bit of bit of the race uh definitely the 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 two upwinds and 30 knots um so we, we didn't have the autopilot off on. Um, I steered quite a lot of it. Dad got a lot of salt in his eye and basically like his whole eye like swelled up and couldn't see out of half of it. Um, so ended up with me helming quite a lot of it and just helming for nearly six hours, six hours completely um, with a couple of like five minute breaks. Was, that was pretty tough. Um, just to to get us through and to try and stop the boat from slamming because it doesn't sound very nice when it slams and it's definitely not quick but you have to try and work quite hard to to get the boat over the waves especially when you start reefing and, and taking away jib area Well fantastic, well done a great achievement, um, great race good to see you back and um, <laughs> yeah thanks for taking the time to check in with us what a performance and what a race.